look around a little bit. But anyway, so the topic today is talking about uh, running a successful game day. Um, let's get things going. Oops. No problem. All right, so I'm Homing Lee. That's my Twitter handle for you, for those of you who likes to tweet. Uh, and uh, that's our company, Gremlin. That's our Twitter handle, so do follow us. I'm not going to talk too much about uh, me. Uh, but I did a similar talk uh, uh, about game days, practicing thoughtful chaos engineering uh, in Berlin late last year. And that video uh, is on YouTube. It has the full details. I'll give you guys more of a, a bridged version here, a little bit briefer. So if you have the time, I do recommend going to check out the, the entire video uh, on uh, practicing chaos engineering um, a number of game days. So to level set everybody, I want to first just talk about what chaos engineering is. This is how we define it. There's a lot of misconceptions in uh, chaos engineering. Is it about breaking things? Is it about um, really, uh, you know, just creating chaos? And it's really not that. Uh, how we define it is thoughtful plan experiments that are designed to reveal weaknesses in your systems. You're really trying to learn about where their weaknesses are and, and identify them so that you can build resilience. An analogy we use is about uh, similar to flu shot or vaccination, where we inject harm, just a little bit of harm, right? Um, inject a little bit of a flu virus into your body so that you can uh, build antibodies, you can build immunity over time. So very similar to flu shots, but we're doing this with uh, systems. So also just want to define game days. Uh, game day is really a dedicated time for uh, teams to really collaboratively run these chaos experiments to, again, reveal weaknesses in your systems. I'm going to talk a lot more about game days, uh, but I think the, 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 I want to really make sure we cover these two topics, right? Why are we doing this and how are we doing this? So those are the two takeaways that I want you guys to have uh, at the end of this talk. So first thing is about objective, right? What are you actually trying to achieve with chaos engineering? And I like this uh, image a lot because uh, you know, I'm assuming most of you have played Mario, right? Um, and looking at this image, you, know, you would really ask, what is Mario trying to achieve, right? Mario needs to definitely defeat Bowser, right? Bowser is that big monster on the side. But Bowser is actually not entirely Mario's goal, right? Mario's goal is, in fact, to save Princess Peach up in the corner, uh, upper right-hand corner. You'll see that in, uh, in the cage. And so Bowser is essentially an obstacle. And you got to really get through the obstacle to you know, achieve your goal and save Princess Peach. So this is how I like put it, right? You're Mario. And there's all these chaos that's in your system. And you really, what you really want is resilience. Uh, so essentially, chaos is that obstacle. And you're trying to essentially uh, get through Bowser, get through all the chaos, understand chaos, defeat Bowser, and save Princess Peach and get to resilience. Um, a pretty popular quote, um, maybe the color is hard to see, uh, but I uh, it's really saying that computer, uh, for an uh, American drama series called In Catch Fire, they say computers aren't the thing, they're the thing that gets us to the thing. Nobody, I mean, people now know that computers are important, uh, but if you ask what computer is, you know, it's just a thing. So similarly, I use that quote, chaos engineering isn't the thing, but it is the thing that can get us to resilience. Uh, why resilience matters, why resilience is important, right? Uh, there have been a lot of big uh, and very notable outages, and they are very, very costly. So with uh, Amazon, with Slack, with Delta, there's these companies that have really, really notable outages that actually make the news. Um, so not only is it costly and it's making the news, if you think about what that really means is, obviously there's money associated with it. There's a lot of dollar amount. But there's actually more than that. You think about employee burnouts. You know, you gotta have on-call engineers to attend to alerts. You gotta um, really uh, uh, wake up in the middle of the night to, to deal with uh, issues that are happening. 
Uh, and there's also the re reputation aspect, customer experience. It's hard to put a dollar figure to it, but you know that when you have a bad experience, people, uh, especially in the more modern society, people can really easily leave your platform to go somewhere else. So um, resilience is this really awesome things. We're gonna you know, dangle in front of you. It's the dream state. Uh, how, do we, how do we get there, right? This is likely what's happening in most organizations. You're really just fighting fire, but knowing that you're, this, this constant stance of firefighting, it's, it's actually never gonna get you to resilience. So here, we encourage people to practice chaos engineering now. Uh, and one way to achieve that uh, is to start running game days. So let's take some action here. Um, oh, sorry, Le uh, some action here, what does that mean? Uh, I mentioned when I define game day that uh, you can run chaos experiments. And when, I, when we call this experience, because we take this scientific approach and if you think about this, you should actually form a hypothesis first. If there's a failure happening, how are you gonna handle it? What's gonna happen? And actually run the experiment and test it. If it's successful, you uh, scale up and repeat. If it fails, you gotta fix the problem, but you wanna verify it and run it again. One state that actually, in this diagram that is, is, is typically for, um, uh, neglected, is that uh, abort condition state. Um, we encourage people to practice chaos engineering in a safe manner. What that means is you gotta actually understand at what point you wanna actually completely stop the experiment. So please, please, please always understand you know, that if there's some metric that you care, really, uh, care deeply about and you don't wanna breach, and if it's getting close to that or breach that metric, you wanna stop an experiment. So I'm just gonna call that out. Uh, we also have these uh, handy chaos experiment forms. Uh, you may see them somewhere lying around. And if not, come to us and we'll definitely can give you a, a, a sheet here. Um, th this helps frame this concept of, of experiment. Right? You want to start with hypothesis, uh, also kind of draft out your plan in terms of what, you, what tools you're gonna use, how are you gonna scope your attack, uh, and essentially run them to verify that it's meeting what you expect. So the, the suggestion here really is just starting small and starting simple. A lot of people uh, jump right into a very complex scenario, right? They'll fail many things at the same time. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a great sort of ambitious goal. But I, I, because it's so ambitious, a lot of people are also very afraid of doing it. So instead of heads on to do something complicated right at the get go, just start with something small, something simple. Shut down a single host, or uh, you know, break just one network connectivity, see what happens. Um, we also get a, a question a lot, uh, you know, whether or not we should run it in production or run in a uh, you know, non-production environment. And our recommendation here is to start in a staging environment. Uh, there's, that's not to say that you should not do it in production, I think the, the, the rule is more not to only do it in production, right? You gotta start in staging. There's a lot to learn uh, just from failing a host in your staging environment, uh, but it's not enough, right? At some point, when you're comfortable with the way your system's handling that failure, you should definitely run some small experiments in production as well, because production is the environment that your customer's on and that matters. So a little bit more about game day. Typically, uh, you know, the anatomy, anatomy of a game day is pretty straightforward. Uh, you run, generally speaking, three to five experiments, and you really want to deep dive into uh, these experiments. And for each of these experiments, it's not really just a single failure injection. You, you can actually run multiple attacks and really, we want to see things happen, and you want to actually repeatedly see, uh, do it so that you can actually learn from what's going on. Um, you're, you're gonna have some people that are like, why do we need to do this? Uh, I, I know exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, there's smart people out there and they're, they can be very, very smart, uh, but doesn't matter how confident they are. They're conf you know, they can be 50% sure, they can be 80% sure, they can be 95% sure. I'm very confident it's gonna behave this way. 
until you actually run it, you're not really going to know. Um, so uh, the, the short answer there is just like, why guess? Why just Stop guessing. Let's actually do it. Let's observe what's going to happen uh, as you uh, run experiments in your uh, environment. Now, obviously, it's that uh, because uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to observe and learn how your systems behave under scalar condition. That observability aspect is super, super important. Um, I, the, the Berlin talk, I, I used some uh, gaming analogies. And so one of the analogy I use around observability is kind of that fog of war for those of you that play games. Um, in a, so for those of you who are not familiar with what fog of war means, right, if you don't have a unit in a, a playing field, you can't see what's going on over there. And the, the couple of screenshots on the, uh, on the right side there will show you that like, it's a big difference if you, have, if you can see what your, what your enemies are doing versus you have no knowledge of that. Because um, if you can see what they're doing, you can strategize, you can uh, you know, counter them, lots you can do. But if you can't see it, you're just really sh shot in the dark. Right? So this, this is how I would like to think about observability. You want to actually be able to understand what's going on in your system and then specifically tackle the problems. There's plenty of tools uh, for observability. Uh, uh, some of them are more, um, um, so there's a, a lot of tools there. And I actually want to call out Flowmill uh, for their ability to do observability as well. So, um, And then as you run the experiments, there's sort of pass, fail, or success, or, 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 or failure. What is success and what is failure? It's sometimes pretty hard to understand what that means. Um, how we like to approach it is whether or not the result is in line with your hypothesis, whether it agrees with your hypothesis or not. Um, most of the time, uh, you know, you have confidence and it, it's behaving the way you expect. It should be, uh, it should actually align, but sometimes it does not. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say here is that whether it's a success or a failure, it shouldn't be a one-time thing. You should actually repeatedly run these experiments and see what happens and see whether or not that's something that's like repeatable as well. Uh, so similar to gaming, again, here, uh, just because you win a game or just because you lose a game, it's one game. You got to keep playing. You want to keep playing, and you want to get better. So game day, it's not entirely a one-time event. That's the problem with a lot of existing uh, DR failover testing and whatnot. You do it once, you check the box, and you're done. Uh, so game day, it's not really a one-time event. We expect people to do it regularly. Uh, so as you're doing game day, you want to, at the end of the game day, you want to start thinking about the next one, what you can do, whether you can uh, verify some of the things that are happening, uh, whether there's new uh, areas that you want to run experiments on. Uh, and then some of the, the success is also not, uh, not really um, easy to understand from a single game day. So it's actually really important to document and note things so that you can actually tra start tracking and measuring success over time. Um, so that's all the high level about you know, why do it and, 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 and how to start thinking about uh, executing uh, some of these game days. I want to take this opportunity to also do a little bit of a, a, a findings, um, some of the general things that we've seen with our customers running uh, game days. Uh, so, there's a few scenarios here as an example. This one, um, they ran an attack on their uh, back end to their uh, database, right? So they were using DynamoDB. And the expectation when DynamoDB is unavailable, you should get internal error, 5xx. Uh, the result, what they saw, was that they got a 404, right? And so it's nuanced, but 404 doesn't really tell the customer or your end user the proper thing, right? This is actually an error on the back end. So this is something that they realize and they, they want to fix. Um, another one that we see as a pretty typical scenario is more uh, legacy application. You just have to inherit it, and you got to figure out what's going on there, right? It'd be nice if they give you an architecture diagram, and some do, right? So, 
you have an architecture diagram of your legacy system architecture, and there's a line between your app server and your database. Um, and so the, the attack they did is they basically inject a little bit of latency between their app server and their database. Um, what they don't see is that the single line can be you know, multiple calls or doing multiple things. And so even though you're expecting that I'm injecting a little bit of latency, I expect about the same amount of latency, uh, slowness, or delay for our users. That is actually not the case. There's some amplification there, and you start seeing uh, more um, uh, uh, longer delay. So now they learn that there's actually something uh, going on there more than just a single call. Um, this is more on the monitoring side of things, um, where uh, there's a, a Kafka stream, uh, or really essentially any message queue, uh, it's pretty similar, where you have a consumer application that's taking messages from the queue, uh, talking to a database, and then processing it. Um, the, the attack's pretty straightforward. You're also disconnecting from the data store, and the expectation is that because you now cannot uh, pull information from the data store, they can no longer process the messages. Um, so that's actually what happened. For this, this scenario, um, it actually met their expectation. The, the, the app, they can see that it's no longer processing uh, messages. The, the processing rate dropped a lot. But what they learn and they realize is that they actually don't have enough visibility to the message queue or the, or the Kafka. They have no idea how quickly it's building up. They have no idea when Kafka is going to run out of space and lose data. So that's actually a really, really critical uh, thing that they, they want more visibility on uh, after they've ran this experiment. Uh, this is a, a, a another one where it's, it's just pretty typical where a lot of people are um, moving towards microservices and containerization. and um, part of why people are doing this is obviously there's uh, decoupling and loosely coupling of their uh, services. And so this is pretty straightforward. They want to kill a container and see that their uh, orchestration will bring up another container. Uh, again, when they were running this experiment, uh, they killed the container. Uh, it came back up. Fantastic. But what they realized when they were, you know, they're using Docker, Docker PS, they looked at it, and they're like, all right, this one, this container that we killed came back up, a couple of seconds uptime, good. And then they started seeing the other con adjacent containers, and they're seeing that a couple of them also started just a couple of seconds in. So then they start looking at it, and they realize basically it's not really fully decoupled, and you've probably heard of the term distributed monolith there's probably something that is still coupling these together. And so when you bring that one container, some other containers go down with it. So that's something they learned. They got to figure out what's going on there. Um, so those are the scenarios that I want to cover. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more that you can think of. Nowadays, applications are uh, pretty complicated. You have everything from the edge that's like doing the DNS, CDN stuff, to your front end tier, to your back end tier, to the infrastructure. Uh, lots of areas where things can fault, can can have faults and and, and fail. Uh, so really, I encourage, we encourage everybody to think about what you can fail. Chaos them all so that you can build confidence and, and resilience in your systems. We're all tech people, so one thing that we often forget is the human side of things, right? Not only are you just testing the software and the and the orchestration and all that stuff. Uh, you can also think about the, uh, uh, the incident management side of things, right? How can you detect things faster? How can you uh, make sure that people, uh, the run books are up to date? Uh, there's actually a lot of human elements to uh, ensuring that you have end-to-end -end testing in terms of having a failure, detecting it, resolving it, and getting to a better state. So we encourage everybody to break things on purpose. That's my talk. Thank you. Next up, we have the buses. Yes.